Good day, everyone. Greetings of grace and peace in Jesus. And welcome back to our series called Fit for Life, all about building habits that will change our lives forever. Now, today is actually our series ender. It's our last message for the series. Make sure that next Sunday, just before Valentine's Day, you, your family, your friends, join us for a brand new series that Pastor Peter will launch. And it will be all about, well, what else? It's February. Obviously, it will be all about love. In the meantime, let's review the messages that we had so far in this series called Fit for Life. Pastor Peter first spoke about how we should develop the habit of prayer. And rightly so, because at that time we were in the midst of our prayer and fasting week. But more importantly, it really has to do with the fact that the entire Christian life needs to be founded and grounded on the habit of prayer. The following Sunday, we learned about how to build keystone habits. Keystone habits are habits that will literally help hold our Christian life together so that we can correctly, adequately represent Jesus here on earth as his ambassadors. In the third message, we learned that we need to make room for good and new habits to form by breaking bad ones. So breaking bad habits was the third message. And then last Sunday, we had a special message from our guest speaker, Dr. Sean McDowell. And he didn't actually have a formal title to his message, but if I were to give it one, it would be Begin Spiritual Conversations. Now, for today, our message will be, you might say, a practical application of a combination of breaking old bad habits and beginning new good habits. And it has to do a lot with the conversations we have. But just before we go into our message, let me share some trivia with all of you. Every year, there are hundreds of words that are included as new words in the English dictionary. And there are also many words that are either removed or are labeled as obsolete and should no longer be used. Let me give you a few examples of those words. Out of the several hundred words that made it officially into the dictionary late last year are, first of all, TBH. I didn't even know TBH was a word, to be honest. By the way, that's what TBH means, to be honest. And then there's the word Amirite. Now, Amirite is not a people group in the Old Testament. Amirite is simply slang for, am I right? Another word that made it into the English dictionary, no surprise considering our situation, is the word super spreader. And finally, Filipinos all over the world will be happy to know that the word chicharron is now officially a part of the English language dictionary. But as I said, there are also words that have been removed or at least labeled as obsolete. For example, the word aerodrome. Aerodrome is just a fancy old word for airport. Here are some other words which have been branded officially as obsolete and therefore should no longer be used. I won't even bother to tell you what they mean, but here they are. Words like frigorific, frutescent, super erogations. I know, right? But what's my point? When it comes to the English dictionary, there are people who assume responsibility for deciding what words should be used and what words should no longer be used. In our Christian life, you and I need to assume responsibility for the words that we decide to use and for the words that we decide to no longer use. As a matter of fact, this is such a serious matter that God would hold us accountable for the words that we use and the words that we don't. Now, let me ask you, are you familiar with this old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? A lot of us were familiar with this saying as we were growing up. 
But the question is, do you agree? Is this true? I don't agree, and I'm pretty sure neither does the Bible agree with this saying. As a matter of fact, I'm sure many of us, maybe all of us, have at least once been very deeply hurt by something that someone once said to us. Words can indeed be very powerful. When I think of this saying, I'm reminded of a true story told to me by one of my friends from a long time ago. This story had to do with a secretary who had, according to her, a very demanding, demeaning, and overbearing boss. And so she really hated her boss. Now, one of the assignments that the boss gave her, this secretary, was to take care of her plant. And so she told the secretary, take care of my plant, and specifically said, I want you to speak to my plant. Now, remember, the secretary was really angry at her boss. And so, yeah, she would try and take care of the plant, but when she would speak to it, she would vent all of her venom and anger towards her boss at the plant. She would use four-letter words. You know, she would curse it. She would even say to the plant, die, die. And you know what? The plant died. Now, I'm not saying it was just because of her words. I'm sure she didn't do a great job taking care of its other needs. But here's really the point. Words can be very powerful. And so you and I need to assume responsibility for what we say and what we don't. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, what does this mean? Well, it doesn't literally mean that a word can kill a person or bring him back to life. But certainly you and I know that hurtful words can cause something to die inside of a person, maybe a dream or an aspiration or a person's self-esteem. In the same way, an uplifting word can practically breathe new life into a person and inspire him to go on with life and persevere. Our message for today, friends, is this. Be a blessing with your words. It's a habit that you and I need to build. And as I said earlier, it involves breaking bad habits as well as building new ones or good ones. And this is applicable whether it's in our spoken word, whether it's in our written communication, and oh, most certainly on social media, especially when there are such heated online conversations about politics, and by the way, if you want to learn how to engage people about political issues in, a, in an edifying, positive way and turn those political conversations into spiritual conversations, we strongly urge you, check out the Christian Values Movement and we will teach you exactly how to do that. Again, back to our message, be a blessing with your words. Even if you use sign language, the principle is the same. Now, the Bible has some very strong warnings about how we should use our tongue or our words. Let me begin with this verse. James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Very strong statement. It's referring to people who are really more concerned about their outward religiosity, their compliance with tradition. And this verse is saying, as it were, if you claim to be, for example, a follower of Jesus, but you do not bridle, meaning control, just like a bridle for a horse, if you don't exercise responsibility over your tongue or your words, then you're deceiving your own heart, meaning maybe you're not even really a follower of Jesus. Or at the very least, 
you're doing a poor job of representing him here on earth. And the conclusion is, this man's religion is worthless. Jesus himself had some very powerful things to say about the words that you and I use. Look at what he said. Matthew chapter 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. In this case, our words. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Now, the background of what Jesus is saying here is that he was rebuking the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who often said one thing but did another. But actually, what Jesus is saying applies to you and me today. Especially this last thing that he said. This is the principle I want us to take away. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. What does that mean to you and me today? And why is it important? I'm sure that many of us know what an oximeter is, right? In this pandemic, almost everyone has had to use an oximeter for himself or for somebody they know. An oximeter is a very small gadget which reads something that's very important going on on the inside of us, and that is our oxygen saturation level. But how does an oximeter do that? Well, it's simply attached to the tip of our finger. Amazing. Well, Jesus is saying in the same way, what's going on within us, in our heart, is measured by what comes out not from the tip of our finger, but from the tip of our tongue. And that's not all. Jesus had even more serious things to say about the words that we use. If we go to the following verses, verses 36 and 37, this is what he said. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, these are really powerful statements by Jesus. When he said careless words, he was referring to thoughtless, unprofitable, and even harmful or injurious words. Now, I believe you and I know that there really will be a time of accountability before God someday. Someday we will stand before him and give an account, a time of reckoning for how we lived our life on earth. But perhaps many of us don't realize that that time of reckoning, that time of accountability will include the words that we chose to speak and the words that we chose to withhold. Now, it doesn't mean that our salvation is dependent on our speech. Of course not. The Bible clearly teaches that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus alone. But how we use our tongue, our words in this life, are clear evidence as to whether or not we are true, transformed, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So, what is our key passage for today's message? Remember our message? Be a blessing with your words. Our key passage is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Now, this will also be our memory verse. We will be going back to this verse several times throughout the message so I can practically guarantee you by the end of this message, you will have memorized this verse. So let's begin together. Let's read it. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now, there are at least three parts to this verse, and those will be the three main principles we will discuss. So how to be a blessing with your words? First, stop using unwholesome words. This is the habit we need to break. Second, 
We need to speak edifying words intentionally. This is the habit that we need to build. And finally, serve others' needs with your words. This is the intention, the objective of why we want to be a blessing with our words. So let's begin with the first principle. Stop using unwholesome words. Back to our key verse. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. The first phrase we want to focus on is this. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. The word unwholesome basically means rotten. Can you imagine something rotten coming out of your mouth? Rotten, worthless, and unfit for use. You and I are supposed to exercise responsibility to not allow these words to come from our hearts and out of our mouths. As a matter of fact, you and I need to check our hearts even before we check what's coming out of our mouths. But you see, folks, from the very start, we need to realize this. We cannot practice this habit simply on our own power. We need God's help. We need the power of His Holy Spirit working in us. Remember the very first message in this series, Develop the Habit of Prayer? Let me share with you an actual prayer from the Bible that will help us guard our tongue, guard our words better. It's from Psalm 141, verse 3. This is a wonderful prayer I learned early in my Christian life. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep watch over the door of my lips. What do you think? Is that a good prayer? I totally agree. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some examples from the Bible of words that are unwholesome and that we should not allow to proceed from our mouths. This list is not exhaustive but it will give us a pretty good idea of the words that we need to avoid using. So let's uh, look at these examples together. The first example is cursing. In James chapter 3, we read in verses 9 to 10, with it, meaning the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Folks, is cursing still in your vocabulary? I certainly hope not. But I'm sure there are those of you out there who struggle with this issue. Let me assure you, there is hope for you. When I first gave my life to Jesus in the middle of 1986, one of the first things that he changed in my life from the inside out was my language. He took away all my foul words, my four-letter words. You see, I, I was a very angry person. So when I'm angry, I curse. But at the same time, if I'm happy, I curse. If I'm just telling a story, I curse. You know, my punctuation were four-letter words. But that is one of the first things God got rid of in my life. And so believe me, if there is hope for me, there is hope for you. But again, the verse says, this should not be, brethren, cursing and blessing the Lord coming out of the same mouth. It should not be. Our next example is abusive speech, very much related to the first one, but a bit broader in its context. In Colossians 3.8, we read, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. What is this verse talking about when it refers to abusive speech? Abusive speech can refer to outbursts of anger, shouting, labeling like you're a lazy person, belittling the other person, threatening the person, putting him or her down, these are all examples of abusive speech. And sadly, there is a lot of abusive speech 
taking place, even, and I would say especially, in homes and in families. If you read the book Motivate by Pastor Peter and Sister Diana, they share a story there about a young man who was a medical student here in the Philippines, although he was from another country. When they met this young man, they realized that he had a, a serious self-esteem problem and he was stuttering. He had a stuttering problem as well. And as they got to know him, they realized that it was traceable to the abusive speech that his father used to speak to him with. You see, as I said, this young man was studying to be a doctor. This man's father was already a successful doctor. And the other son was also a doctor. And the father would tell this young medical student, you do not have what it takes to become a doctor. You will never be like your brother, a successful doctor. Praise God that he heard the gospel and he became a follower of Jesus. And by the grace of God, he overcame his low self-esteem. He found his sense of worth in the Lord and he did become a doctor. But see, were it not for the grace of God, he could have been permanently damaged by the abusive speech that he heard repeatedly from his own father. Let me share with you an illustration of how harmful abusive words can actually be. Many, many years ago, I attended a seminar and it talked about the harmful nature of abusive words. And the speaker said, every time we speak a hurtful word towards a person, it's like it's like we drill a small hole in that person, emotionally speaking. So each time we speak a hurtful word, an insult, a put down or something else, imagine it's like we're drilling small holes into that person's being. Abusive speech indeed should have no part in a Christian's vocabulary. Our third example is lying. In Colossians 3, 9, it says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Let me ask you, how many spouses have had their hearts broken over a husband or wife who had been lying to them about a relationship, about money, about anything else? How many parents have had their hearts broken when they realized that their child their teenage son or daughter, for example, had been hiding things from them and lying to them about the life that he or she was actually living. How many church members, even small group members, have had their hearts broken when they realized that their spiritual leader was actually living a double life? The answer to all three questions, too many. Another example of unwholesome talk or unwholesome words is what the Bible calls silly talk and coarse jesting. In Ephesians 5, 4, it says, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. What is the Bible referring to when it says silly talk or coarse jesting? That word silly, is where we get the English word morons. And the term coarse jesting basically refers to crude, tasteless humor. It reminds me of one of our members, a father. He was respectfully rebuked by his own children, and he has many of them, by the way. And the reason why his children rebuked him is because he had a habit of making jokes about, you know, people who had a struggle with, say, being overweight or not getting enough exercise or even making jokes about struggles with uh, gender confusion. And his children decided to say, Dad, enough of this. You see, we have friends, they told their father. We have friends who actually struggle with these issues. And their struggles are real. 
and we shouldn't be making jokes about them. Instead, we should be finding ways to help them. Very wise words from young people to their father. Because no matter how old or young we are, we can always improve in being a blessing with our words. Number five example is slander and gossip. 2 Corinthians 12.20 says, For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances. What do those two words mean, slander and gossip? Well, slander is telling lies about someone else that damages that person's reputation. Gossip, on the other hand, is sharing information to people who have nothing to do with the issue. Now, why are these unwholesome? Because they cause division and they cause damage. And sometimes the damage done will be next to impossible to repair. It reminds me of an old story about a young man who was guilty of slander and most likely of gossip as well. The story is told that he repented, but a wise man wanted to show him the extent of the damage of his wrongdoing. So he took this young man who was into slander and gossip, and he told him, bring a pillow that's full of feathers. And so he brought him to a very high place, and he said, take the feathers from the pillow and scatter the feathers into the wind, which the young man did. And then the wise man said, now I want you to go after all of those feathers and pick them up one by one. And the young man said, sir, I think that's impossible. And the whole point was, when we are guilty of slander and gossip, many times the negative impact can be irreversible. So folks, what is our message today? Be a blessing with your words. And we said that there are three parts. We now come to the second part, which is to speak edifying words. Back to our memory verse, but I'll just focus on the phrase that's relevant to this next principle. But only such a word as is good for edification. In other words, we're not just to stop unwholesome words from coming out of our mouths. We need to be intentional in thinking what edifying words can I say to this person? And the word edification means the act of building. Hence, the, syn the synonym for building is edifice. How do we now make the transition from stopping unwholesome words to speaking edifying words? Again, as I said earlier, we cannot do it simply by our own power. We need to pray. P-R-A-Y. This is a habit that Pastor Peter has been reminding us of for quite some time. And that is P, pause. R, resist the first impulse. A is to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And Y is yield to the Holy Spirit's control. And when we do this, we will be ready to speak edifying words. What are some examples of edifying words in the Bible? Okay, let's begin with the most obvious one, encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So the whole idea of the word encourage is to come alongside a person, to help him. It's the same word that describes the Holy Spirit. One verse that tells us how powerful encouragement can be is found in Proverbs 16.24. It says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. How does this work? Folks, in my first few weeks of my recovery from COVID last year, not to mention the loss of my wife to the same disease, I was in constant medical consultation with my doctor, who happens to be from CCF and also from our small group. And so this doctor would monitor my condition, monitor the medicines I was taking, the progress I was making, and so forth. But at one point, I believe the doctor sensed that I was losing my, my spark for life. 
I was losing my desire to persevere. And so she paused from our medical conversation and she just said to me something very simple. She said, be patient with yourself as you recover. God has a plan for your life. He has things for you to do and people for you to minister to. Man, I tell you, those words went a long, long way. Encouraging words. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it tells us where we can find a source of such encouragement. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. My friends, in our small groups, and certainly in our families, we should be sources of encouraging words towards one another. You know, during the Omicron surge, so many small groups found many of their members and the families of their members infected by the virus. But they would encourage one another. Of course, they would pray for one another, but you would see even in their chat groups, sharing helpful tips, experiences, suggestions. They would rejoice whenever somebody would recover. That is the advantage of being part of a small group. And so, my friend, if you're not yet part of a small group, I strongly urge you, visit our online welcome center at the end of this message, and they will help you become part of a small group. Second example in the Bible of edifying words is speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. What does this mean, speaking the truth in love? Let me give you an example. Every year, my fellow pastors and myself, we go through an annual exercise called 360-degree feedback. This is an opportunity for our fellow pastors, our family members, uh, people we work with, uh, even members in our small group to give honest, candid feedback about our strengths, but more importantly, our areas for improvement. And you know, when we see the summarized information, it's nice to read about our perceived strengths, but it's painful sometimes to read about the areas of improvement or our areas of weakness. But we need to hear these things because they help to build us up. In our families, in our homes, I pray that we will be able to speak the truth in love. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath. How does this work, especially at home? I remember when my late wife and I would have disagreements, which were few and far between, I must say. What I would do is I would often approach her and remind her, we are not each other's enemy. We have a common enemy and we need to stand united against him. So it was not only truth. It was also in the delivery the tone of my voice, and she would always appreciate how gently I would give her that reminder. A third example of edifying words is apologies on the one hand and forgiveness on the other. In the story of the prodigal son, Luke 15, we read, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly! Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Apology, forgiveness, both edifying words. It reminds me of that time when this man was kneeling in front of his wife and asking for her forgiveness. You see, the wife discovered that he had had multiple flings. And this man actually didn't even expect his wife to forgive him. But you see, this woman had become a follower of Jesus not long prior to this incident. And so she forgave him with a very gentle voice, with unconditional love. And this paved the way for this man to himself become a follower of Jesus. Another example 
of edifying words is prayer. In Numbers 6, 24 to 26, it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. My children and I are in very constant communication almost every day. But many times the way we end our conversation is in prayer. It is my privilege to bless them in prayer. And I know that they're very happy to receive that blessing. Another example is a couple of weeks ago, one of our members sent me this very unexpected text message, which truly blessed my heart, and it had to do with prayer. He said to me, I remembered you in my prayer today. I pray that God will continue to bless your leadership in the church and that he sustains you behind the scenes. I pray that God will continue to expand your borders and that he will protect you from the traps of the enemy. I remembered also to pray for God's comfort for you and that you will always feel complete in him. What can I say to a prayer like that except, Amen, may it be so, Lord Jesus. Our final and best example of edifying words is, of course, the gospel. In John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Friends, to show us just how edifying, how powerful and life-transforming the words of the gospel are, please listen to the story of our brother, Ivan Tan. Good day, everyone. My name is Ivan Tan. As I look back at my past, I can definitely say it was filled with many bad habits. Swearing or heavy cursing was one of them. As a kid, I thought it was the norm. I was exposed to people cussing left and right, especially in school and places where I hung out. It got worse when I was much older. Every time I would open my mouth, foul words were always the first to come out. I used them not only as a form of expression, but also as a way of intimidating and hurting other people. This included friends and family. I had total disregard for who I was talking to, where I was, or what occasion I was in. My profane and abusive language was a perfect match for my arrogance and pride. Nobody tried to correct me. Maybe I would not have listened anyway because I was full of myself. I feared no one and had this belief that I could do and say whatever I wanted. I was always on attack mode. At the same time, I was living recklessly. I was into drugs, womanizing, and out of control. Then God dealt with me. I lost everything that was valuable to me and was left with nothing. This was my lowest point. I was hopeless. I had nowhere to go and no one to turn to. I met a man who loved and served the Lord. He was a music composer and a song leader in their church. He learned about my condition and knew I was about to be homeless. Without hesitation, he welcomed me into their home. For almost two years, I lived with this family. With them, I experienced and witnessed a different kind of environment from what I was used to. I watched how they lovingly related with one another. They were kind with their words, affectionate and respectful towards each other. There would always be conversations about God, and every day they would play and sing worship songs. I believe this was how God personally revealed himself to me. Slowly, I was being drawn, and I found myself wanting to know more about Him. As I discovered who God is and how much He loves me, I humbled myself and put my trust in Him. This journey brought me into complete surrender, and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When I gave my life to Jesus, I prayed that He would change me and remove all the ways in me that did not honor Him. One of the things He removed was the habit of swearing and cursing. It was instantly put to a stop. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I have not sworn or cursed for the last 16 years. Those who knew me before find this unbelievable. But with God, all things are possible. I still have much to improve in terms of how I use and choose my words. I confess that while I no longer curse, my struggle with controlling my emotions sometimes leads me to speak hurtful words. Thankfully, the Lord is faithful to convict me when I do, and He teaches me how I can do better. God has changed my heart and has given me the desire to please Him both with my actions and with my words. Now that I have my own family, my wife and I share this conviction. 
We will do our best to live out our faith and create a loving environment for our children where we all practice habits of open communication, constant encouragement, genuine acceptance, and unlimited forgiveness. Please pray for us that we would always speak words that bless, build up, and reflect who Jesus is. Gracious, merciful, loving, and kind. To Him be all the glory. Praise God, Brother Ivan. I am so sure so many have been blessed with your words. So let's go back to our message. What again is it? Be a blessing with your words. Three parts. Stop using unwholesome words. Speak edifying words. And now the objective. Serve others' needs with your words. That is the last portion of our memory verse, of our key verse today. It says, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And the word grace here means leaning toward the other person to give them benefit. Folks, as we end our message, I'd like to tell you that the best example of a person who speaks words to bless according to the need of the moment to give grace to the one who hears is none other than Jesus himself. Let me give you just a few quick examples as we wrap up. Do you remember the woman who was caught in adultery? The religious leaders brought her before Jesus. Jesus was writing on the ground and then one by one her accusers left. Well, we pick up the story in John chapter 8, verse 10, where it says, Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Why did Jesus say these words? Well, he knew this woman needed to hear at least two things from him. Number one, she needed to hear that she can find forgiveness in Jesus. But she also needed to realize that sin is a very serious matter and a truly repentant person through a relationship with Jesus and the power of his spirit will be able to overcome a life of sin. My friend, I pray that the words of Jesus will speak to you today. Are you caught in a sin today, my friend? Jesus wants you to know these same two things. That when you enter into a relationship with him, your sins will be forgiven. And through his power, you can overcome your present life of sin. Do you remember the Apostle Peter? Of course you do. He was the one who said, Oh, Lord Jesus, I will go with you, even if it means I will die with you. And not long after, he denied Jesus three times. But after Jesus resurrected, he had a private conversation with Peter. And this was the tail end of that conversation. In John 21, 17, Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Folks, Peter knew that his love for Jesus was not perfect. But that day, Peter needed to hear that Jesus still wanted him on his team and that Jesus still had something for him to do, that he could still be useful for the kingdom of God. And so Jesus told him, Peter, tend my sheep. My friend, are you a follower of Jesus whose love has grown cold or whose, whose passion has waned? Maybe you've turned your back on Jesus and have gone the way of the world. Come back to Jesus today. He wants you to know that he wants you on his team. He still has a plan for your life. If you think that you've become useless for the kingdom of God, think again. Because Jesus may well be telling you what he told Peter that day. Tend my sheep. So my friends, one final review of the three ways that we can be a blessing with our words. 
Number one, we stop using unwholesome words, we speak edifying words, and we seek to serve others' needs with our words. But you know what, folks? We've said this earlier in the message. There is no way that we can do this consistently in a way that pleases God if we do it on our own power. It needs to be through a relationship with Jesus Christ and by the power of His Spirit. And that's why I'm reminded by this final story of how Jesus spoke edifying words to a man who needed to hear this truth. The story is about Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What was Jesus in essence telling Nicodemus that day? Nicodemus was a man who prided himself in his religion, in his own morality. But Jesus is saying, you cannot live a God-pleasing life on your own power. You need to have a relationship with me. You need to have me change you and transform you from the inside out. That is the meaning of being born again. Being born again is not a religion. It is the result, the transformation that takes place when a person fully surrenders himself to Jesus as Lord and Savior. My friend, if you want to be a blessing with your words, if you want to be a blessing with your life to others, if you want to truly represent Jesus on this earth, you need to first be in a relationship with Him. If you haven't done that yet, if you haven't surrendered to Jesus to make Him your Lord and Savior, don't do it tomorrow. Do it right now. As a matter of fact, let me bless you by praying in your behalf. Will you tell Jesus something like this? Come on, pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love for me. I thank you for speaking the truth so clearly that I cannot live out this life of blessing people with my words purely on my own power. You want me, first of all, to have a relationship with you. And so, Lord Jesus, today, I give you my life. I surrender to you myself, my entire being. I open my heart and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now, Jesus, change me from the inside out, my heart, my mind, and of course, my words. Help me to represent you well and to be a blessing to others through all the things that I do, especially with my words. Dear Jesus, from this day forward, I belong to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for promising that you will never leave me nor forsake me. I give you back the honor, the glory, and the thanksgiving. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. If this message has been a blessing to you, we would like to get in touch with you. There are instructions at the bottom of the screen how you can chat with us. We would also like to connect with you through our online welcome center. You can do that through Zoom or through chat. Again, the instructions are at the bottom of the screen. If you need prayer, please do not hesitate to visit our online welcome center. We'll be back shortly with Sunday Fast Track and our discussion questions. In the meantime, may the words of the Lord bless you now and forever. Good day, CCF family. I am Pastor Iko De Leon, representing CCF Eastwood and also the big ministry. And I'm here today with Pastor Ricky Sartu for a Sunday Fast Track. For our first question, you mentioned in your message that lying is one way of speaking unwholesome words towards our brethren. So my question is, would this include white lies, especially when we're trying to protect or avoid hurting them? 
Thank you, Pastor Ikoi. That is indeed a very relevant question. First of all, the term white lie obviously does not appear in the Bible. And I, I believe that when we talk about lying, we're talking about purposely distorting or withholding the truth with a malicious intent to deceive, particularly for our own benefit. Okay, so that's the general definition or description of lying. Now, I know where this question is probably coming from. It's like in a situation where a dearly loved one has been diagnosed with a serious disease and the family is asking, should we tell our family member or not? That's probably an example of a situation where this question is coming from. Well, first of all, I do realize that every situation like this is very delicate and has its own set of circumstances. But I believe in general, based on the Bible that says we need to speak the truth in love, we need to do exactly that. I believe that the person needs to know the truth. Now we will need tons of wisdom from the Spirit of God, how to say it, when to say it, who should be the one to say it. But in the end, I still believe in the principle, we must speak the truth in love. Thank you, Pastor Ricky, for that answer. And for my next question, we are commanded to love our enemies, but admittedly, it is very difficult for a lot of us. So how can we genuinely serve and edify them through our words? Wow, that is a really tough one, Pastor Ikoi. Now, the question is, how can we genuinely serve and edify them through our words? Well, first of all, I would say, make sure that this person has not become your enemy because of something wrong you did to them. Because if that is the case, the first thing you need to do is to apologize and ask for forgiveness. And I believe that will be a sample of edifying words you can speak to them. But if you have not done anything to really earn their anger towards you, and if you have an opportunity, let them know that you're praying for them, for example. After all, Jesus said we should pray for those, for example, who persecute us. And let them know that you love them. Let them know that you've forgiven them for any wrongdoing that they've done against you. And how they react to that, well, that's beyond your control. Now, some of you might say, tell them I've forgiven them. What if they haven't even apologized to me? Very valid question. And I know there are arguments on both sides, but I remember the example of Jesus. As he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he was speaking within hearing distance of people who were not apologizing to him, but who were actually driving nails into his hands and his feet. So if you ask me, should you forgive even if the person has not apologized? First, forgive them in your heart. But yes, if you have a chance, let them know that you've forgiven them by all means. And for our last question, Pastor Ricky, as elections get near, how do we respond to people who have different political views or are aggressively disagreeing with our own beliefs? The hot topic of the day, politics. <laughs> well, I actually go back to the message from last Sunday about beginning spiritual conversations. Our brother Sean McDowell talked about bringing down walls, building bridges, finding common ground. Perhaps, again, by the power of the Spirit, you can find first common ground with people who may have differing political views versus yours. That common ground could be the love of our country. And then you can proceed to talk about how you personally believe you should choose a leader. And then you can talk about biblical values. So again, if you want to learn how to wisely vote for our elected officials, especially this coming election, and you want to help other people learn how to do the same thing, check out the Christian Values Movement, where they will teach you about uh, Christian values like character, competence, justice, accountability, family, and these are all Bible-based. And Lord willing, this could be a common ground that you can win them towards so that you go beyond discussing politics and then turn the political conversation 
into a spiritual conversation about Jesus and the gospel. Thank you, Pastor Ricky, for answering all our questions. And that's it for our Sunday Fast Track. God bless. Here are some discussion questions you may find useful with your family and your small group. Number one, what unwholesome words do you need to stop? For example, cursing, abusive speech, lying, silly talk, coarse jesting, gossip, and slander. Number two, what edifying words do you need to speak more? For example, encouragement, truth and love, apology and forgiveness, prayer, and of course, the gospel. And number three, don't be afraid, but ask people in your family and in your small group how you can be more of a blessing with your words. Have a wonderful time blessing one another with your words as you discuss. Thanks for watching. We would like to invite you to be a Christ committed follower by being part of the movement as we honor God and obey His Great Commission. To find out if there's a CCF satellite near you, log on to www.ccf.org.ph satellites. We also want to encourage you to join a small discipleship group where you can deepen your knowledge and love for Jesus and others. To sign up, log on to www.ccf.org.ph slash discipleship group. All of CCF's video resources are available free of charge and are constantly being improved by our team. Would you consider supporting CCF through prayer and giving so more people can be blessed? You can give securely through our website at www.ccf.org.ph slash give. For more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks and God bless.